Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I have the privilege of sitting down with one of the most tenured fund managers at Fidelity, and that's Joel Tillinghast. Joel has been managing money at Fidelity for over three decades, and the fund he has been managing since its inception in 1989, the Fidelity Low Price Stock Fund, has an outstanding long-term track record. We talked to Joel about his interactions with Peter Lynch, his investment process, why good managers need to think about where they're wrong and what might go wrong, and much, much more. This is a great discussion with a successful manager who has seen many different markets and has stuck to his investment process and what he knows over time. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Fidelity's Joel Tellinghast. Joel, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure to meet you. We are going to talk about your investing career at Fidelity. I think some of the biggest lessons that you've learned throughout your career, uh, your stock picking approach, how you go about Uh, defining value and intrinsic value investing, and then managing portfolios that are, that are built for the long run. Um, And I think, you know, you've seen and done a lot in your career um, and you've done very well for many of the investors in your fund. So I just hope Jack and I can bring a little justice to everything that you've done um, in, in the investing world um, throughout the discussion today. So really, really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. It's going to be good. There was a article over the weekend in Barron's. Um, I'm I'm guessing you've seen it. And they sent a note to Peter Lynch to thank him for that. Yeah. And the article was talking about um, how at Fidelity and some of these other, you know, few other investment management shops, how great generations of investors were sort of born out of um, firms like Fidelity. And to your point, Peter Lynch was quoted in the article, uh, but your name was in there along with your colleagues' names, Will Danoff and Steve Weimer. Um, and I'll, I want to ask you about something Lynch sort of said in that article in a moment. But before I get to that, let me just, there's the story of your, your famous cold call to Peter Lynch early in your career. So I thought we could just start there because I think it's a pretty cool story about how you went about getting your job at Fidelity. Yeah. Um, I had worked at Dex Brennan Lambert um, in uh, 1986. They were beset by a bunch of legal problems. Uh, I loved working at Dexel because some of the you know, people I worked with, like Richard Sandor, you know, were absolutely brilliant and great at their job. And in his own way, Mike Milken was too, but uh, I guess they had legal problems. And uh, so I job hopped to Bank of America. I got a title of vice president of research and strategy. And, you know, except the negatives started sort of immediately uh, when I was there. Uh, The, you know, company announced a $640 million loss, um, which was big money at the time in their June quarter, and this shocked the market. And that was the same day that we had our inaugural booze cruise um, to celebrate joining the company. Uh, Shortly thereafter, my boss um, was working from home, which uh, was a very bad thing in the pre bid pre-COVID times, um, and I realized that I wanted to work for people I respected um, technically and ethically, Um, and I had huge respect for everyone at Drexel, technically, but worried about the ethics and had less respect for what was going on at Bank of America because people were very depressed at the um, inaugural booze cruise um, because they knew layoffs would come after the um, $640 million loss. 
And in fact, Bank of America sold Charles Schwab back to Charles Schwab, which allowed him to become a billionaire. Um, so I set out with a very short list of people I wanted to work for. They were basically um, George Soros, Michael Steinhardt, Michael Price, Mario Gabelli, and Peter Lynch. And I didn't get great responses from anyone, except when I called Peter Lynch, um, his secretary, Paula Sullivan, um, asked who's calling and put me through. And you know, retrospectively, I think Peter Lynch was who I wanted to work for most of all, um, especially the same site. Um, I did have to come in and do a formal interview with everyone. And, and I say, if you're working in finance, choose people who you want to work with, who respect the craft of investing. You know, think about that more than anything else. Fidelity has been a fantastic environment for that, as the Barron's article hinted. A great lesson there on uh, a little luck, a lot of initiative, somebody willing to give you an opportunity. Um, and, you know, talk to you and then kind of put you on the career that you've had, which is, I think, great for a lot of young people that are thinking about entering the workplace. But to your point, finding people that you respect, that are ethical, that are good people. That was what I want, which is there, I'm sure there are hundreds of good people in the, you know, but, that I wanted really exceptional. I wanted to work with exceptional people. And at Drexel, I did, except they may or may not have been exceptionally ethical. If you, if you could bottle up uh, some of the key lessons that you learned from Peter Lynch over the years, what, what would those be? I've got three. Um, one, consider many possibilities. You know, cast a wide net. In other words, um, look at a lot of stocks because Peter's formula was you, check ten, you study 10 stocks, two will be immediate buys, Two will be immediate sells, and the rest will be the. And so, if you study more stocks, you'll find more opportunities. But also, when you're thinking about the future trajectory of those, consider all the possibilities. Uh, second thing is constantly look for new information, especially contradictory information. Well, Peter was exceptional at changing his mind. I'm not sure that I'm so good at it, but but he's exceptional. Uh, third, um, mental whiteout, putting bits of information out that, um, out of mind that are holding you back from making the right decision. Um, so he um, said, if you white out this stock chart and see that the stock has already risen um, by 100%, it's already doubled. Um, a value investor is likely to you know, say, oh, I've missed it. It's it's too late. You know, rather than looking forward and saying, it still has exceptional value. Or a momentum investor, you know, and since I'm terrible at momentum, I may be misspeaking. They'll, they'll look at that double and say, well, it means I'm prone to thinking it's a buy. You know, but are the is the business getting better at a rate that could justify the best. One of the points that Lynch made in the Barron's piece was that you, Will Danoff, Steve Weimer, you guys were more, and I want you to kind of shake this out a little bit. It was, you know, Fidelity has a great research department. You guys have lots of flexibility and freedom, but part of your long-term success is that you guys are acting as analysts as well. What do you think he meant by that? We are trying to double check the facts and logic of the designated analysts and you know, are trying to make sure that it makes sense to us. You know, Cause sometimes people lose sight of the fact that there are different types of investors. There are momentum investors, there's long-term growth investors, there's value investors. And you know, you've got to make sure that the facts that they're presenting make sense to you. Cause Fidelity being a big place, there are analysts who are best at momentum. And you know, so I'm looking for a different thing than a momentum investor. I'm wondering, you just mentioned the different types of investors. If you were to describe, for someone who hasn't followed you in your career, if you were to describe your approach to picking stocks, your investment strategy, how would you describe it? I say I'm a value investor who you know, 
present value is the value of future cash flows from here to eternity, you know, discounted back. When you look into that future, you, know, you five years out, well, e even a year out, things get a little fuzzy. Five years out, they get very fuzzy. And 10 years out, they get fuzzier still. So I want quality. I want you know, the ability to look into the future. You know, a statistical definition of quality is a sustainably high return on capital in a strong capital structure. Quanti qualitatively, you want a business that's going to throw up growth options at high returns. And so it's a flexible value investor who tilts towards quality um, because the value, the outlook of you know, a mediocre retailer is much less visible than the outlook of Visa and MasterCard until the trust busters come in, which I don't think they will. Yeah, you know, a couple of things on what you just said. You know, one is I think you, you've alluded to a trap I've, I've fallen into in my career, which is thinking that value investing is just buying stuff with low PEs. You know, and whenever we talk to great investors like yourself, we always get the same thing, like what you just said, which is, you know, are, are you familiar with Michael Mobison? Yep. When, when we had him on the podcast, he said, he said, I, I gave like a, a description of value investing that were, you know, was revolving around buying cheap stocks. And he said to me, he stopped me and he said, value investing is buying something for less than it's worth, full stop. And, and I still remember that. And I think that's common among, you know, great investors like yourself is they, they look at value investing, not as necessarily buying something that's cheap statistically, but buying something for less than they think it's worth. Although the statistically cheap is a happy hunting ground, but yeah, within that, you, you want to gear towards quality when you can. In reading, uh, preparing for this, you talked in some other interviews about the idea of intrinsic value and trying to buy something for less than intrinsic value. How do you think about that? That seems like it's a pretty difficult concept in terms of like calculating the intrinsic value of a business. How do you think about that? Think about the, you know, the believability of the inputs in, into a discounted cash flow. Um, do you believe the earnings 10 years out? You know, and Sometimes I look out 10 years and say, I can't believe that and ask, well, how far out you know, do I believe? And so it's, it's more about checking the believability of the inputs. Um, I also try them with and without terminal values because I think that there's a lot of BS in a lot of terminal values where you know, people justify fast growing high tech things by saying that you know, 10 years out you know, when the company is making billions of sales and earning fantasy margins, they'll value it at 30 times EBITDA. And no, I, 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 you're concealing a lot of bogus assumptions in that terminal value. So, so I try, if you don't have a terminal value other than cash, you know, how much of the value can you foresee? Can, can you get your money back from things that you think you can see? I'm just curious on, on this idea of projecting out in the future. How do you think about management of companies. You know, we've had people on the podcast who say, you know, they love talking to management. They think they get great, valuable information from that. And then we'd have others who say, management just tells you what you want to hear. I get no value from that. Like, how do you think about that, talking to management and its value to you as an investor? If you ask you know, bad questions, you'll get you know, bad answers. And what you're hoping to take away is, do they have any thought of how they're going to deal with problems that they haven't had to. And that's a key part of good management. Now, do they have a process for dealing? What if inflation is here to stay and you have to live with 5% inflation for the next 10 years uh, with inflation erratically going up and down in a stop start sort of way? Um, I'm not saying it is, but they should be thinking about that. Uh, what if artificial intelligence really is a big thing? Um, how will that affect your business? Um, if, if you're you know, just asking them, how's the next quarter going to be? Of course, you're going to get you know, happy talk and stuff, but you should you know, ask them, 
what are you doing to expand the moat? What are you doing to offer something exceptional to your customers? The, yeah, they're, they're biased to the happiest, you know, yeah, they're, they're biased to put on the good news first. As you look through your career, if you look at the strategy, like the way you invested when you first started managing the fund, and if you look at the way you're doing it now as you, as you wrap up um, this year, how much has your strategy evolved? I mean, do you think you've had the same core strategy the whole time, or do you think there's been significant evolution a, as you've gone through the years? I think there are a lot of threads of continuity. Um, I was looking for undervalued stocks, and I'm still looking for undervalued stocks. I think I you know, recognize the you know, importance of moats and competitive advantages more, um, even though I'm still drawn by dumpster diving, um, checking to see you know, what's, what's super cheap. Uh, I'm obviously 30-something years older, and so you know, don't have the energy for high turnover. You know, and that works fine in a um, value investing set where patience is useful. Whereas I think if I was you know, a momentum investor, then it would just be exhausting. Do you think when you look back, uh, people will say that, you know, technology has increased a lot over the years. There's more people working in Wall Street. There's more competition. Do you think stock picking is harder today than it was at the beginning of your career? Or do you think there hasn't been an appreciable change there? What's easier is it's easier to access high frequency information. Um, when I started as an analyst at Fidelity, there were a couple of companies that did not have faxes. And so I would call and ask the treasurer to read the earnings press release line by line um, so that it would say, uh, cash, $9 million, inventories, $22 million. Um, and there were sometimes nuggets in that that inventories had gotten high or whatever. Um, that's now instantaneous. Um, trading is much more automated. You know, thanks to Bernie Madoff <laughs> and the only good thing that he may have done. Uh, what's harder is navigating all that information without distraction and keeping focused on the useful information. That's part of the Peter Lynch mental whiteout um, where some information you just got to ignore. Uh, the other tough thing is there's a lot of winner-take-all industries in a way that there weren't 30-something years ago. And when I look at what are the small-cap artificial intelligence plays, uh, NVIDIA is not a small-cap stock. Well, as good as I can do is super micro and SMCI, um, but it's not really the same bet as NVIDIA. Um, and that is how the um, winner take all sort of skews the investing. One of the things that I've struggled with in my career is, is because of my nature as a value investor, when I see something I'm holding going up a lot, my first inclination is always, I got to sell this thing. Like it's getting expensive. I got to get rid of it. And exactly, Peter Lynch, mental white out, but you've got to put that out of mind, especially if you are a value investor in part and say, how does the value look, you know, today, given what I know about the future? So is that, is that the key to it? I, I know, I know like in your career, you've held things like monster for a really, really long time. And you've been able to, to do that when a lot of value investors may not have been able to. So is that, is that really the key is you just evaluate it as if it were a new investment today and look at it that way and don't worry about what the price performance has been? One that is the mental white out, you know, applies to the stock price history but not the track record of the company. Um, you also have to think about, um, you probably know more about a company that you already own than something new. So, you know, how, how much are you giving up in your knowledge of the information? Um, but yeah, you, you want to evaluate, does it look good today? And mentally, I think I have a, separate class for you know, extraordinary businesses where you put Monster or United Health or you know, some of the other ANSYS companies that you know, have appreciated a lot and say, it's hard to replace them. You know, if I look in consumer durables, well, consumer non-durables, 
5% unit growth is nirvana, especially with a lot of categories suffering from shrinkage or you know, falling per capita consumption. So how would I replace a stock like Monster? There is a price for everything. And if that growth is not exciting enough to justify the, the price, then you know, that would be a sell. But have, have a separate class for extraordinary businesses. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We had, uh, we had Steve Romick on the podcast and he was talking about this idea, going back to what we talked about earlier with quality and, and it fits in with your idea of extraordinary businesses. He was talking about how he used to feel like a quality company. He wanted to look to the balance sheet and now he feels like he wants to look at the quality and the consistency of the business. He thinks that's kind of a shift he's had over his career and a big lesson he's learned is that you know his quality, his protection during downtimes comes from the quality of the business itself. I, I, I think that's right, but I think you want to set it in a quality, in, in a financially stable um, setting. Um, one, one of the Fidelity fund managers, um, Bruce Johnstone, made a lot of money when R.J. Reynolds did a leverage buyout and issued bonds which traded to teens yields and were deeply discounted to par and you know, the quality of the business you know, came out. The tobacco is a yucky business, but it throws off a lot of cash, and he was in a senior position, you know, whereas the equity holder you know, was in a riskier position, although that worked too. I'm curious, you know, one of the things I think that's changed in your career is back when you started, there probably wasn't much going on in terms of factor investing. I don't think factor investing was really a thing anymore. You know, People quantitatively just trying to buy a basket of cheap stocks quantitatively and using that as a strategy. I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts on that as a strategy? I know you're, you're, the way you manage the fund is obviously not very similar to that, but do you have thoughts on that type of strategy and, and how it might work? When you see a factor, you ask, why, why might it produce better returns? Uh, and so if I see uh, the, a free cash flow yield produces excess returns, you know, that, that might seem to me like, uh, well, if the if free cash flow is an accurate representation of economic profit and returns to shareholders, then of course higher free cash flow yields are going to turn into better returns to the investor. But um, I talked to the um, one of the people at one of those top secret famous coin shops where they would have to kill me if I identified them, um, and said that uh, several years ago, uh, probably 60% of what they were doing was, you know, maybe even 80% was data mining with a thesis. And now they've gone so that more than half of it is data mining without a investment thesis. And you know, the, the guy at this point shop was not very comfortable with it, but thinks that that's where it's going to go um, because artificial intelligence is not very transparent about why it's waiting that. Um, and so if butter production in Sri Lanka is correlated with the S&P 500, um, they will use it and their track record uh, is pretty extraordinary. Um, but th this employee, you know, and I, would not be comfortable with with the direction that it's going. It's interesting. There was a, there was a public quote, and you know you don't get too many quotes out of Renaissance, but there was a public quote from Robert Mercer where he basically said some of the factors that have worked best for us over the long term make absolutely zero sense. And it gets back to what you're talking about, like those types of guys that are maybe operating in the high frequency world. They don't worry about you know as, as a value investor, I worry about like does my factor make sense. They seem to think that it's better for them if it doesn't make sense because then more people aren't going to chase it. Um, so it's an interesting contrast. Yes, and and that was exactly what my guy at the famous hedge fund was trying to to say. Do you have quantitative parts to your process? Like, do you have like an initial screen you'll run before you dig into companies in depth? Do you, do you have any parts of your process that are quantitative? If there's been a um, big change or disruption, dislocation in a specific industry or sector. Um, I use it to see what looks cheapest, what has the best balance sheet. Um, I definitely use it, use a quantitative approach in you know, 
somewhat homogenous groups like banks. Yeah, it's, I think if you're comparing opportunities, you have to get to numbers somewhere. Yeah. And you, and also just with the, the volume of stocks that are out there, you know, just, just getting it filtered down to something, you know, although you, you at Fidelity are probably different than other managers and that you have a huge team of people who can analyze all those stocks. So, you know, managers that have smaller teams will start with a quantitative process just to get down to something they can manage, but that may not be as much of an issue, you know, at Fidelity. Yeah. But, but I think even at Fidelity, there are finite analysts and it's good for them to start with, you know, banks that have a track record of profitability, um, a good underwriting history yeah, to, to do some some sort of screen, but but also try to qualitatively create a valuation curve and say, um, or junkie stocks, um, nine times earnings might be a attractive price, but for a quality stock, um, maybe I'll stretch to 16 times or get, or more if it's a really high quality stuff. One of the questions I like to ask to people who've been managing money for a long time is, is about inflation because I'm seeing inflation for the first time in my investing career. So I have no personal, you know, I've studied history, but I have no personal experience with it. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on putting what we're seeing right now in context, having seen inflation before in your investing career. Uh, I came in when inflation was high, but like you, my entire experience, except for the last year or two, has been interest rates always fall. Interest rates can go to zero and beyond or below. Yeah. Um, and inflation is um, not something to worry about. And this is why I look for managers who try to see around corners and think about what is, because I have biases about whether inflation is here to stay, but I don't know. And you don't either. And you want businesses that can adapt to it and that are thinking about uh, how, how they'll pass through the prices and adjust the costs. Higher inflation is not good for equity returns, although, you know, it did do an internal you know, study, 10 baggers in the 70s, and it turned out there were 10 baggers in the 70s, which was the last high inflation. You know, Period. How do you think about the macro environment? Does that play a role at all in your process? So in other words, do you think, all right, inflation's here. I got to look at my portfolio and make sure I've got things that'll do well in inflation. Or when I'm looking at new positions, I've got to, you know, look at things that might do well in an inflationary environment. Do you, do you care about the macro environment a lot? Or do you just look at yourself as a bottom up stock picker? I'm going to pick, pick the best companies that can do well in a variety of environments. And I'm not going to worry about the macro environment too much. The best companies are ones that have business structures or management that will be able to adapt to inflation if it lingers or um, or not. Um, and I try to adjust to, you know, if, if you do have lasting inflation, you have to get into real accounting and say, you know, if you've got 4% inflation, and your bank is making, which holds all nominal assets and liabilities, if it's making a 10% return on equity, it's really making a 6% real return on equity. Um, will that return on equity you know, rise, you know, or will, will that match changes inflation or, or not? And stocks are partly a nominal asset and partly a real asset. But if you're saying, yeah, yeah, I never have a special insight that GDP will be down 2% in the first quarter of 2024, and therefore I should sell all my consumer discretionary and put it into consumer staples. I, that, that never happened. Joel, I think if I'm doing my, my math right or looking back, I think you've been through, I'm thinking about bear markets here since you've been at Fidelity. So just hear me out here. You went through... The 1987 crash, the early 1990s, the late 90s, early 2000s, the 2008 financial crisis, and then the COVID crash. So all those bear markets are obviously very different. You were actually investing through all of them. I mean, if you could sort of give an important lesson for investors that go through, and all investors do, all equity investors, there's going to be bear markets in the future. Um, but what, you know, how would you advise people deal with those to try to not make mistakes during bear market? Think about Okay. 
uh, channeling the 80s crash dance, what a feeling. Um, so start with some insight about how you're likely to react if, if the stock prices of your favorite stocks are down 40%. Most people feel sick and reach for the air flight bag. Um, the good thing about being a value investor is that a lot of times when the stock price is down 40%, there is some news that it affects the value of the stock, but the value is not down 40%. So if you thought that an $80 stock that was worth 100 is now available at 40 and maybe it's worth 90, your future upside is you know, much, much better. And so unlike momentum investors or growth investors, you know, value investors have something that can keep them cheerful when you know when they're getting the same client calls saying how did why did you lose me all that money you know, which you will but do you rush for safety you know i guess uh, i thought that you know, the covid crash yeah, would be a more prolonged effect on the economy and stock market. And I remember you know, listening to a home builder that was selling for two times earnings that had told me, you know, we had sold the in person. It was a virtual closing and a virtual purchase. And it's, wow, that, that is spectacular. Your, your business can carry on even though, you know, People are thinking they're taking their life into their own hands when they leave their home. And the stock was selling for 30% of the value and two times 2019 earnings. I bought the stock, but I didn't load the boat. And usually I assume that it was more a prolonged, you know, the global financial crisis was more of a drip torture where, you know, you know, I kept feeling like I was buying bank stocks at a discount, and then the facts would be revealed that showed that I just didn't have a full grasp on the fact and that there were credit impairment and on glasses. And I'm not sure if I'm speaking to what you wanted. No, I, I think what I'm drawing from that is, you know, all of these bear markets, you know, are different. And you know, even some of the best investors out there can't necessarily see when they're going to end or how long they're going to be. Um, and sort of maybe maintaining your process through that was what the most important thing was, sort of summarizing there. Yeah. If, if you're a momentum investor, don't suddenly become a born again value investor because the stock is down 30%. And it's uh, that with, you know, some less successful investors after the craze of the mean stocks in 2021 came to an end that, you know, the, the price was stupid at the peak and it's still stupid. Uh, it's not a value, you know, and you should have stuck to momentum or whatever your process is. But, but you also have to think about how will you feel if your stock is down? Will you say, you know, I will buy more as if now a more spectacular upside? Will you say, I want to destroy the evidence and get rid of the pain. It's not an easy answer and only you can answer that yourself. I wanted to ask you about index investing for a minute. So since the financial crisis, obviously passive investing has seen a massive increase with, you know, compression on fees and more and more investors moving to passive indices. And, you know, a lot of active managers over the long term haven't outperformed the passive indexes. So I'm wondering. The two questions I have is one, just generally, I mean, you're, you run active funds and there's a number of very good long-term performing active funds at Fidelity. So on the one hand, you have the track record to prove that active management can work. On the other hand, Fidelity and all these big firms obviously offer their clients and investors passive low cost funds. And that's fine. And okay. It's probably a good thing for your average investor, um, saving on the fees. So I'm just, so the, the one question is around just your overall thoughts on passive investing. And then the, the second part of that is, when a fund like yours underperforms passive, you know, 
Talk to how investors can make it through. What's important for investors that are investing in your fund and in any active fund at Fidelity, even when Lynch was at Magellan, he didn't outperform all the time. It wasn't, you know, year over year outperformance. Like Bill Miller had like 15 years of outperformance over the S&P 500, and then all that came to a crash. But it's just the point of being able to stick with a strategy for the long run and the importance of that. So those are two somewhat related questions that I'd like to get your thoughts on. Okay. Yeah. Um, for people who are moderately interested in investing, but are not willing to spend a lot of time, I think an index fund is a very sensible solution. Um, it's good to be invested. Um, and I guess I'm disappointed that for pension funds and university endowment, there is not yet an index fund or private equity, venture capital, and all the other hype products they seem to be stuffing a portfolio with. Um, so in that sense, you know, I not only support inve passive investing for some investors, you know, I'd like to extend it to a certain category of professional investors. You know, if you are going to choose a active fund, you want a manager that is doing something different consistently. You, know, you don't want someone who is looking a lot like the index. You know, their process should make sense to you. You know, should ask them, what is it that you are doing? You know, and you want somebody who cares more about the process than their career. You know, and we're all human and we all want a good career and we all would like to be good investors. But as a manager, you want to separate your desire to be a good investor from the desire to have a good career and then focus on craft of being a good investor. And that I think is what you wanted in an active manager. Yeah, no, that was, I think that was, was perfect. And the, the kind of follow up to that was, and maybe you just answered it. So if you did, that's okay. But, and I know you have co-portfolio managers on the funds that will, you know, as you sort of look to eventually hand over responsibility, they'll take over the lead portfolio. But if, if, if you were to give someone walking into your office today, that's going to assume responsibility for management of the funds, what advice would you give to them? Keep learning from your mistakes. Study them. Um, you don't have to share them, your mistakes with others. But you should study them. Um, also, know yourself. Um, know how you're going to react if you know, your Halloween is just the beginning of a terrible period for the stock market. Or if we have unexpected rally and um, everything goes up 20% by year end, you know, how are you going to react? But keep keep learning from your mistakes in every way you can. Oh, and Peter Lynch, keep keep learning. Be open to new information. Love that. And we we uh, like to ask all of our guests a standard closing question, which again, you may have just answered it with that response, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway, just in case there's anything you want to add or if it's different. But what we like to ask our guests is based on your experience in the market, if you could impart one lesson to your average investor, and not your portfolio manager here, but your average investor, what would that be? It's again about knowing yourself and what it is you think you are doing. You know, do you think you're a value investor? Do you think you're a growth investor? Do you think you're a momentum investor? Um, and why, why will that add value? Because it's very competitive. And it's also useful to know that, gosh, I'm not really that interested in investing and maybe an index fund is the best thing for me. If, if I've already covered that, then the one thing would be think about your circle of confidence. Think about what industries or types of stocks your knowledge is, you know, better than the average market participant where it's worth. There are, as Peter Lynch said, if you're a doctor, you have lots of insight about 
drug companies and healthcare services. Um, there are industries that they just cannot fathom really well. Um, kind of anything in Kathy Wood's universe, I, I can't look out with confidence 10 years from now and say, wow, I, I believe that by conviction, but she can. Yeah. Um, but um, it's important to know that I am not the one that you want guiding you on super high growth um, futuristic companies. I'm not the person you want on biotech. Yeah. Um, because have no skill in forecasting phase one, two, three uh, approval and how that turns out in the market. Um, I have no skill in airline or um, some commodities, um, which is kind of unfortunate in a some but more inflationary environment. Well, Joel, thank you very much for coming on, sharing your perspectives, your wisdom, your uh, humility when it comes to investing and what it takes to uh, be a successful long-term investor. So Jack and I feel very privileged that you've taken the time to join us. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Best of luck with everything. And thanks so much. Really appreciate it. And thank you. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.